Good evening. I am so happy to have Robin Dawson back with us from Medicare Solutions Network to talk about Medicare. Robin is the expert, has presented for us many times, and can answer your questions. Hi, Robin. Thanks for Hello. being here. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Sound okay? Everybody can hear? Sounds yeah. great. Okay. Um, no, I really appreciate the library bringing me back. This is a topic that Aaron knows I'm very passionate about. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts when somebody embarks upon their journey to Medicare. And so we try to uh, boil it down to some of the basics, give you some useful information, and hopefully today you'll leave this webinar tonight um, having felt like it was an hour well spent and uh, you got some questions answered and dispelled some of the myths that are out there. Um, I know that Erin is going to be monitoring the chat throughout the presentation, so please feel free to answer, you know, ask any questions that you have and we'll, um, we'll try to address those as we go and then I'll certainly hang out um, for as long as needed uh, to answer the questions at, at, at the end if there are any that we didn't address during the topic. So as Aaron mentioned, I'm an independent health insurance broker. That means I do not work for the government. I do not work for Medicare. I do not work for Social Security. Um, I contract independently with insurance companies to help people with the private insurance pieces that they're responsible to choose on their own when they join the Medicare system, okay? Today is not a sales pitch. We're gonna talk about the basics. We're gonna talk about what Medicare does and doesn't cover, what your out-of-pocket costs are, and what the difference is between some of these plans that you get advertised to at nauseum if you're about to turn 65 and, and really throughout your Medicare journey. And so this is my contact information. I'm happy to assist you. There's no charge for our services. We're here to help. Um, a lot of people feel like this guy when they when they come into the Medicare system or they're about to start um, by signing up. They, it's like a big piece of uh, a maze that you have to put puzzle pieces together. And, and like I said, there's a lot of moving parts that the first of which starts with your enrollment in Medicare A and B through the Social Security Office. Um, as you start down this road, and even throughout your aging process, you'll get a lot of information um, from friends and family, family and they, they mean you well. They want to give you all the advice that they didn't get or, or the things that they learned along the way. Um, and they'll, they'll maintain that, you know, it's absolutely true because it happened to this person or that person. And one of the things I always encourage people to, to think about when they're embarking upon Medicare is that this journey is pretty unique to you. Your circumstances around enrollment are going to be unique to you. The decisions you're going to make about products are going to be unique to you. And so while the government has a lot of things out there that are helpful for, for people, and we're going to talk about what some of those phenomenal resources are tonight, I just want you to know that they're all written for the masses. And so when, when your individual situation is, is laid into that, um, you know, you might get a different outcome than, than another person, or you might have a different answer to, to the same exact question that they had, um, depending on your circumstance. Um, one of the things that I like the best um, is this Medicare and You book. That Now, this is the Bible of my industry. It comes out usually in the summer, um, and it gets sent to people who are already enrolled in Medicare. That's the downside, because quite frankly, um, it's a really good resource for people that, that aren't in Medicare yet. It's a, it's a very helpful source of information. Um, for those folks who get this already because you're already in Medicare, don't throw it away. This is the one thing that I would hang on to throughout the year. And then for those who aren't in Medicare, I would um, strongly encourage you to go to my second favorite research resource, which is the government website. And you can download um, that government book under this basics tab. OK, on, um, if you click on this link, it'll be a, there'll be a drop down that um, talks about publications and um, you'll be able to download a PDF of that Medicare and you book. Um, please note the URL on this website. This is Medicare.gov. You know, it's the government website because it's got a .gov URL. Anything that has a .com URL is a sales site. OK, don't go on to a dot com website, type in your name and information for a free quote, because the minute you hit send, your phone's going to start ringing off the hook because agents like me buy lists of people that go on those websites and, and then they just get robo called to the nth degree. So if you don't want your phone to start ringing um, to the level that is of annoyance, um, I would 
stay off of those sites, but the government websites are really good. All, everything on this website is a clickable link, okay? This Find Health and Drug Plans tab right here below the woman's picture, um, this is one that I use when I'm helping people navigate um, to different plan options. Um, we'll talk about how we can use this a little bit later, specifically in the fall during the annual enrollment when you want to look at maybe changing plans. Um, but like I said, there's a lot of resources um, on this website, and, and it can be a bit of a rabbit hole if you don't know exactly what you're looking for. Um, this Get Started with Medicare button, if you're going in to just find out about enrollment, you will ultimately end up on the Social Security website. So ssa.gov, the Social Security Administration website, that's where you actually sign up for Medicare. Um, you'll you can click through these buttons on the medicare.gov website, but all, all paths are going to lead to um, the Social Security website. That's the entity through which we sign up for our Medicare A and B benefits, which is our federal benefits from the um, government. So what is Medicare? Well, it's the health insurance for seniors. A senior is defined as a person 65 or older, um, and that is when you're eligible for your Medicare benefits. Now, it doesn't matter if your birthday is the second of the month or the 31st of the month. You're going to be eligible for Medicare Part A and Part B on the first of the month in which you turn 65. Now, there are certain a certain population of insured that um, do come to Medicare early via disability. Maybe they have certain conditions like end-stage renal disease or Lou Gehrig's. They're going to qualify at any age for their Medicare benefits um, upon those diagnoses. If someone's taking Social Security disability benefits, once they've been collecting disability benefits for 24 months, on the 25th month, their red, white, and blue card will just show up in the mail. OK, now at that point, that person has a decision to make. They can keep their Medicare benefits or they can decline them. Maybe they're working or their spouse is working and they have other creditable coverage and that employer sponsored plan is working really well for them. Um, they can certainly decline the, the Part B benefit, um, not the Part A, but but they can decline the Part B, which is the part piece that has a premium. And they can wait until some point in the future when they want to turn that on. OK, um, there's. One thing about this slide in particular that I want everybody to sort of pay attention to, and that's the, the very last sentence. Medicare is really good coverage, and I hope when you leave tonight's session, you'll have a better understanding of what it does and doesn't cover. But the one thing that it was never designed to cover is everything. There, there are certainly gaps in coverage. Um, there are co-pays and deductibles and co-insurance amounts that we're responsible to pay as insured members in the Medicare system. And so those gaps are what create an opportunity for us to seek out other coverage to help, you know, kind of round out a more complete offering and offering that perhaps we may have been used to having up until this point of joining Medicare. So this is where your journey begins. This is kind of the red, white, and blue card that you get when you sign up for Medicare. Your hospital benefit is what Medicare refers to. Um, it's Medicare Part A and Part B is your medical benefit. Um, I talked about the enrollment window. It actually starts or opens up three months ahead of your 65th birthday. People always ask me, you know, Robin, when should I contact you? When should I start my my um, uh earnest, you know, signing up in earnest with Medicare and trying to figure all this stuff out. Um, and I usually tell them, you know, you can't really do anything about it um, until three months ahead of your 65th birthday. That's when you can actually get into the Social Security system and enroll. You can do that online. You can do it over the phone. You can go into the office and do it in person. If you show up six months ahead of your 65th birthday and, and you don't have another special reason that qualifies you early, a social security representative is just going to turn you away. They're going to tell you to come back. Okay. So at, now you do also have three months after your birthday. So if you want to sign up um, and you want your benefits to start the first of the month in which you are eligible, um, then I would encourage you to sign up um, either, you know, month one, two, or three ahead of your birthday. Um, if you decide to wait until the month of your birthday or sign up three months after your birthday, that's fine. Um, just know that your Part A benefit will be retroactive to the first of the month in which you became eligible, which is your birthday month. Um, but your Part B benefit is going to be delayed by one month. And that's important because especially if you're trying to time it with coming off of an employer sponsored plan or a COBRA benefit or something of that nature, you just don't want to make sure you want to make sure that there's no gap in coverage. OK, so it's important to know that you'll be delayed the, the medical portion of Medicare, which is the bigger piece of your benefit. That's going to be delayed by by one month if you enroll the month of your birthday or any of the three months after. OK, now a lot of people ask, do I have to enroll when I turn 65? And the answer to that question is maybe. 
Okay. Maybe you need to enroll if you don't have other creditable coverage in the eyes of the federal government that would reserve your place to come to Medicare at a later date without a penalty. So what do I mean by that? Well, technically, um, if you've worked 10 years or 40 working quarters or your spouse has, and you've contributed into the social security system through payroll deduction, you know, and taxes, um, your Part A benefit will be a zero cost. You've already paid for it. So you could turn that benefit on if you wanted to, and it would just stand behind your employer-sponsored plan um, as, as secondary, okay? The Part B piece is the piece that has a monthly cost. And so if you're going to continue to work and continue to avail yourself of your employer-sponsored coverage, you might not want to turn on that piece, okay? Because you'll essentially be paying for something you're really not using until you get off of that insurance. Um, but the uh, the Part A and the B could be turned on at age 65 if you want to. So sometimes people stagger their enrollments. Um, anybody who hasn't contributed into Social Security for at least 10 years or 40 working quarters and has enough tax credit for a zero premium Part A, then they do need to turn on their Part A at age 65. Okay. Now, Part B can be delayed if you are working or your spouse is working, and that, Im that insurance that you have from your employer is based on that active work status, okay? So it's not a COBRA benefit or a retiree benefit. Um, it also has to be with a company that has more than 20 people, all right? Now, if, you're, if you work for a really small employer, um, you could turn on Medicare and continue to work, but in that situation, if the employer was small, maybe there were only 10 people, it was a small law practice, let's say, um, then your Medicare would need to be primary and your group insurance could be secondary, okay? So there's a variety of situations in which people may or may not need to turn on their Medicare benefits, and it's circumstantial around what their current coverage is. Um, Affordable Care Act coverage, you got to get off that, okay, um, when you turn 65 and, and you got to get to Medicare. Um, and it, like I said, also too, nothing that's based on non-active work status. So no COBRA or retiree benefits could be retained as primary. You'd have to turn on Medicare Part A and B. All right. Um, okay. So why do sometimes people decide to continue with their group insurance and maybe delay on Medicare? Well, the Medicare Part B piece is graded for income. So the more you make, the more the government may charge you for Medicare. Um, when you do file, so let's say you're filing for your Part A and B benefits this year, um, what this, the government is going to do is they're going to look at your most recent tax return they have on file for you. And if as a joint filer, you make more than 206000 in modified adjusted gross income, um, you may pay, you may have to pay more for Medicare. And um, the government will actually assess that income adjustment. It's, call, it, it's called IRMA. It stands for Income Related Monthly Adjustment Amount. They'll assess it on not only your Part B benefit, which is your medical coverage, but also your Part D drug coverage. Okay. So the base premium this year for every American is 174.70. But if you're an individual filer or a joint filer, and again, modified adjusted gross income is the number they look at. If it's above these levels, then you're going to start to ratchet up to these higher brackets, okay? Um, and then the way that the drug plan works is there's about 22 different drug plans available in the state of Illinois this year. The prices vary from zero to maybe $130 a month. Um, but if you get bumped for your income on the medical portion, it's also going to be tacked on, a flat amount is going to be tacked on to your plan premium for your drug plan, no matter how you get it, okay? Okay. Um, so let's say you do decide that you want to enroll in Medicare A and B when you're first eligible. You're not going to defer on the on the Part B piece. The one thing that um, you need to understand is that that forms the foundation of your coverage. Okay, so Part A and B, your hospital and your medical insurance, we're going to break that down in detail tonight. The one thing the government does require that you pick up when you step off of that other qualified coverage you have and you turn on your Part A and B is they want you to have a drug plan. Okay, they want everybody to have prescription drug insurance. That's Medicare Part D. Doesn't matter if you're not taking anything, good for you if you've stayed off prescriptions your entire life, but you still need to have a Part D drug plan. All right. And we'll talk about, you know, you can get your foot in the door with a zero premium plan this year. There's there's actually an offering that, you know, allows you to have creditable drug coverage and not pay any monthly premium for that coverage. 
Um, your Medicare Part C offering is actually a private insurance product that replaces Medicare. We're going to talk about that tonight as well, okay? But usually, if you're adding Part A or B, um, that would qualify you to then pick up a Medicare Advantage Part C plan if you wanted a private insurance company to administer your benefits in Medicare, okay? So it's an alternative to Medicare and some people decide to choose that path when they begin their journey or later on in life, they, they sometimes transition to that type of insurance. So this is kind of the 10,000 foot view of Medicare. This is actually gonna be part of those handouts that I give the library to send to you all after um, tonight's discussion. But I think, Medicare is a pretty complicated topic. There's a lot of moving parts and I'm a visual person and I think visuals help. So I like to tell people this is the 10,000 foot view of Medicare, right? Um, when your journey begins and you fire up your A and B, you actually have a decision to make because A and B is really good coverage, but it's not complete coverage. So the first decision you're gonna need to make is which path do I wanna travel? Do I wanna stay the course of original Medicare and piece in my drug coverage and maybe get some backup Medigap insurance to support me in my out-of-pocket expenses? Or do I wanna go to this managed care model where I have a private insurance company running all of my benefits in Medicare, Part A, Part B, and Part D? So it's an either or choice. Um, and like I said, you can choose either one at the beginning of your journey or throughout the aging process, okay? So let's talk a little bit about what our core benefits um, in original Medicare give us. Medicare Part A. Now, on your red, white, and blue card, when you get your Medicare ID, which, by the way, takes about a month or two to process, so that's why it's good to kind of get ahead of your enrollment, um, Medicare Part A covers you for a finite amount of things. If I could rename Part A, I would call it your facilities coverage because it covers you for all the big facilities you're going to come in contact with. The most important being your, your inpatient hospital care, okay? So hospitalizations when you're admitted, bill to Medicare Part A. Skilled nursing, if you have to go on to post-acute care, rehab, maybe after a hospital stay, um, that is also covered under Medicare Part A for a finite period of time. Um, maybe you don't have to go on to a rehab center after a hospital stay. You can go home and recover. But let's say the, the doctor orders to have a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant come to your home to do medically necessary things. That would be considered home health services. So they're helping you um, administer medications, maybe change wound dressings after an operation, maybe do physical therapy, okay? Um, this isn't home care. They're not gonna clean your house or go grocery shopping or help you with your activities of daily living. It's gonna be a short-term in duration, a Medicare approved provider, and they're gonna do medically necessary things in that home health bucket. And then hospice, whether it's end-of-life hospice or hospice that leads you back to palliative care, whether it's in or out of your home, it's going to be covered fully under Medicare Part A. Now, I mentioned before that for most Americans, not everybody, but most people who contributed into the tax system during their working years, the Part A benefit has, our, has been paid for during those years. And so it has zero premium, but it definitely has financial exposure for folks in the Medicare system. And that looks like this. So in 2024, if you're hospitalized on the very first night that you're admitted, Medicare is going to look to you for a $1,632 deductible. Now, that's a big number, but it covers you upon discharge up and through day 60. So what that means is on night number one, you know, that, that charge is going to trigger for you. But let's say you go in for an appendectomy. Everything's great you go home three or four days later. And then two weeks later, you have a heart attack and you're back in the hospital. You're not gonna get charged that $1,632 a second time because it's within that 60 day benefit window. But let's say the appendectomy happened in February and then the heart attack happened in November. Well, on day 61, post-discharge, that benefit would have reset itself. So in that particular year, if two of those things happened 60 days apart from one another and you were admitted to the hospital twice, you'd have to pay the 1632 a second time, okay? Um, now, Medicare certainly covers us for hospital stays beyond 60 days. Um, the next 30 days, days 61 through 90, um, actually bill out at $402 a day. And then um, the next six, 60 days after that, days uh, 150 through, I'm sorry, days 90 through 150, bill at 800 a day, 
Okay. So a little bit higher amounts um, that you're going to have to pay for Medicare um, if you're there for longer than 60 days. But the, most people just think about that, that deductible number. Um, skilled nursing is covered um, fully in the first 20 days, but there's a floating asterisk here. I like to say Medicare is filled with a lot of partial sentences, half-truths, and floating asterisks. If you're not paying attention, um, Medicare will catch you in the first 20 days in skilled nursing if you don't have three nights preceding that under admission in a hospital. So that benefit to have it be paid for by Medicare, you have to have three midnights under admission. Now, if you're there for longer than 20 days, the next 80 days will bill at $204 a day. That's your responsibility. Um, but Medicare is not long-term care insurance. It's not going to pay for you to go to um, you know, a long-term care facility, and it's not going to cover you past 100 days. So at that juncture, Medicare is done paying, and you would neither, either need to pay out of your assets or invoke a long-term care insurance policy. Um, home health services, I mentioned before, that's when somebody, you're skipping the skilled step. You're going right to home to recover after your hospital stay, but someone's coming to the house to do medically necessary things. And then hospice generally is a, is a covered, a fully covered benefit. Um, to be fair, you might fill prescriptions to keep you comfortable at end of life for a 5% copay. But other than that, um, it's a fully covered benefit. So again, Medicare Part A has no cost. You've already paid for it during your working years. Um, most Americans, some people might have a premium if they haven't contributed to the social security system for 10 working years, um, but it does have some financial exposure. Medicare Part B. So your Part B services is everything that a medical provider uh, would support you in. So it's all of your doctors, all of the surgeons, the anesthesiologist that knocks you out so the doctor can operate on you. All those folks are going to build to Part B. Um, it's all of your lab services, so a blood panel or a biopsy. It's, it's many of the diagnostic tests, so it could be an EKG, an EEG, an MRI, a PET scan, a CAT scan, all the expensive, what I like to call alphabet soup. If it's got an acronym, it's probably covered under a diagnostic test. Um, durable medical equipment is also covered. Now, these are things like walkers and wheelchairs, of course, but also pacemakers or COPD machines or insulin pumps or lancets and test strips. The diabetic supplies that you get, even though you might get them through a mail order pharmacy, um, they're actually billing to the medical portion of Medicare, not your prescription drug coverage. Um, it would be all your physical and mental health therapies, any ambulance rides, so the transport service to and from the hospital, all the things that happen in the ER, and then any outpatient services. Now, this is a very big bucket of stuff. And it got the outpatient services got even bigger during COVID, right? Because they didn't want anybody in the hospitals um, unless they had COVID. So a lot of procedures and, and things of that nature were done um, in these outpatient settings, um, sometimes ambulatory surgery centers. But um, what would also be considered an outpatient service would be if you go into the ER, maybe you're not feeling so great. And the doctor decides, you know, until we've figured out what's going on, we run some tests, make a diagnosis, we're going to keep you here overnight. And you cross over that 24-hour mark and you go into the next day and then the next day. They may never admit you. They may finally figure out what's going on, patch you up, send you home. All of that is going to bill under Medicare Part B because it's an outpatient. Okay. And then clinical Rx, this is the rough stuff, chemotherapy, kidney dialysis, radiation therapy, Medicare's got your back for any of that, infusions, injections. Um, if the, the, the rule of thumb is, is if it's administered in a clinical setting, in a doctor's office, in a, in a lab or an infusion center, um, it is going to bill to the medical portion of Medicare, not the prescription drug coverage. Okay. Now, Medicare Part B, um, I mentioned before it has a premium. 174.70 is the base premium this year. We do see it go up a couple dollars every year. Um, it will be graded for income. So the more you make, the more you might have to pay for Part B. And the Social Security Office will determine that upon enrollment. It does have an annual deductible of $240, which, you know, considering that compared to the Affordable Care Act or even a lot of really good group insurance plans, that's a very low deductible. And then after that, Medicare will take their negotiated discount on all of these services, which you're going to absolutely love, and then they'll split bills with you 80-20. They'll pay 80 cents on the dollar. You'll be responsible for 20 cents on the dollar. So that's the good news. Here's the not so good news. Medicare is an unlimited benefit, so they're never going to cap you out on what they pay. That's, that's positive. 
But the downside is this 20% coinsurance on all these things, there's also no max out of pocket on that. Okay. And similarly, sky's the limit on any hospital charges or skilled nursing charges that you might rack up in a calendar year. Okay. And people aren't really used to that. If, if we've been fortunate enough until this juncture in our life to either have an individual Affordable Care Act policy or, or to have a group insurance policy or something from a union, um, typically those plans have had some worst case scenario number, some max out of pocket, right? Well, Medicare doesn't work that way. Unlimited benefits come with unlimited exposure. And so most people don't just walk around with that red, white, and blue card in their pocket, okay? Because if they do, they're one, you know, catastrophic event away from having this 20% coinsurance be sky's the limit for them. So it's, it's important for people to think about minimizing their out-of-pocket expenses. And that's when we kind of go back to these two paths and we have some decisions to make along this journey. A lot of people will start their journey in the path of original Medicare because it allows their network of providers to blow right open. Maybe they've been in an HMO at work or maybe they've been in a PPO, but the Medicare network is about 90% of all doctors in the United States. So that's a big, big network. But certainly they want to back up their Part A and B coverage so they don't have to pay sky's the limit on their portion. And they will often look to a Medigap plan, also called a Medicare supplement, to do that job for them. Now, the government defines 10 Medigap plans. So the important thing to know about these plans, and I know they all have letters, which is somewhat confusing to people when you have the parts of Medicare and then you have Medigap plans that have similar letters. But when we're talking about plans, I'm, I'm referring to these Medigap plans. So the important thing to know about these policies is that the government defines what they cover. They simply let private insurance companies sell them to the public. So this is where I play. This is, you know, I contract directly with the carriers to help people make decisions around providers and levels of coverage and, and things of that nature. Um, but there's a lot, of, a lot of options out there. I think there's about 42 different companies in the state of Illinois that sell these products to the public, okay? But the important thing to know is that if you're buying a D plan or an L plan or an N plan, that coverage is identical no matter who you buy it from. And people will often say to me, well, Robin, you know, if they're looking at four or five different insurance companies, you know, will my doctor take this Medicare supplement plan from this particular insurance company? And what I say to them is you're asking the wrong question. Will they take Medicare? Because in this situation, your supplemental policy is your secondary bill payer to Medicare. Medicare is your primary insurance. Medicare, therefore, is your network. All right. Now, you might say, how the heck am I going to decide this? Well, one thing to keep in mind is that there have been about three plans that have driven the, the majority of the sales in the market over the last decade plus, I would say. And that's the FG and the N plan. And the reason is, is because if all of the coverage that I just spoke about that you're responsible for, the out-of-pocket expenses under A and B, are on this far left benefits column. When you go across the rows, what you want to see is 100%, right? Because when that what that means is that the insurance policy that you're buying um, is going to cover 100% of your portion that you're responsible for. And people's eyes like to gravitate right down the middle to this F plan because F is for fantastic, right? It wipes out every single thing that you would be responsible to pay, that Part A coinsurance, if you're in the hospital for longer than 60 days, the 20% copayment under Part B, um, all of your skilled nursing coverage, if you're there for uh, longer than the first 20 days, your Part A deductible, so that 16, over $1,600 charge, um, even your Part B deductible is that 240 is paid for, okay? So the F plan was very popular for many, many years. Problem with the F now, though, is that in January of 2020, legislation was passed that basically said anybody who is becoming Medicare eligible after that date, meaning they're turning 65 and turning on their Part A after January of 2020, they can no longer buy Plan F. They also can't buy Plan C as in Charlie or the high deductible version of F. And, and you might say to yourself, if you're in your you know, 70s and qualified for Medicare prior to January 2020, well, that's great because I have the F plan and, and I can hang on to that. That's true, you can, but here's the problem. Um, when you buy one of these policies, you're joining a risk pool of people that bought that insurance plan from that company. 
And everybody has to, you know, the claims get shared among the whole population of insured. So there's safety in numbers when you're buying one of these plans. You definitely want to be joining a risk pool of people that's constantly adding new 65-year-olds every year, right? And the F plan simply can't do that. Neither can the C plan. So the price of those policies are going to continue to rise. I mean, the price of all Medigap plans do go up as you age every year. I tell people, you know, budget on average 5 to to 8% a year over the life of the policy. And I would say on average, that's a good, you know, some years it might be higher, some years it might be lower, but that's a good number to sort of plan for increases, annual increases around. Um, but you definitely want to be in risk pools that are adding new people. So if, if you want very robust coverage, like what the F plan offers, I would strongly encourage you to look at something like the G plan, because the G literally covers everything the F covers, right? Except there's one empty box, F covered it, G doesn't cover it. And if we go across the row, we see, oh, that's the Part B deductible, which if we go back to our cost structure under Medicare, right, it's $240. So if you're willing to take on the first $240 in billable charges under Part B, after that, anything that Medicare pays for, your G plan will pay for, okay? Comparable to that level of coverage, you might say to yourself, well, Robin, I'm, I only go to the doctor a handful of times a year. I don't, I don't need that lavish of coverage. Um, I might encourage you then to look at plan N, as in Nancy. Plan N is really similar to the G and the F in that it pays all your hospital charges. It pays 100% of the co-payment for the Medicare Part B. Um, it does require that you pay that Part B deductible, but it pays all your skilled nursing charges and the Part A deductible. But we do have some floating asterisks we need to pay attention to here, okay? So under Part B, what it says for Plan N at the very bottom of this chart, and by the way, this is also part of that handout that this library will distribute to you. Um, Plan N is going to pay 100% of that 20% coinsurance under Part B, except you might have a nominal co-payment for office visits, which right now Medicare caps at $20. Or if you go to an ER and you're subsequently um, discharged, you're not admitted, triggering the Part A deductible, you'd have a $50 co-payment. So if you're willing to pay the Part B deductible, just like you would on the G plan, that $240, and you'd be willing to take on some co-pays for office visits or ER visits, your premium will go down a little bit, okay? Now, there's one other thing under Plan N that has an empty box. That's called the Part B excess charge. And if you notice, there are no Medicare supplements that are available to the public anymore that cover that except the G plan, because remember, the F plan has been turned off to new enrollment, okay? So no other Medigap plans cover that. It must not be that big of a deal. Um, well, what it is, is that if a doctor ever decided to balance bill above and beyond what Medicare reimbursed, um, that's called a Part B excess charge. Now, as I mentioned before, a large portion of doctors in the U.S. take Medicare. A similar portion take, take Medicare assignment. That means they're billing and accepting Medicare's negotiated discounted rate as payment in full. Okay, There's a very small percentage I think 2% uh, nationwide is the last statistic I saw that may balance bill, okay? So if you got an excess charge come your way, you'd have to pay it if you were on a plan N, okay? If you were on a plan G, it would be paid for by your supplement. Now, the excess charges are, are uh, capped by Medicare at no more than 15% of what Medicare agreed to reimburse, OK, so it's not like the provider could charge the difference between what they build and what Medicare charged or they could charge some exorbitant amount. It's, it would be capped at no more than 15 percent of the Medicare negotiated reimbursement rate. Now, in addition to those more popular plans that cover a lot of things, you have some plans on here that cover portions of things. The K and the L, because they're only covering portions of things, they do have a max out of pocket limit. Um, if all you really want to do in the Medigap world is put a firewall behind your Medicare benefits, that's an option too. You could do the high deductible version of the G plan. And what that would say is you have to pay all those costs under Medicare Part A and B. So the deductibles, the coinsurance, um, the, the co-pays for services. But all of those amounts as you paid them would count toward a calendar deductible of $2,800 in 2024. 
So that essentially is putting a firewall behind your Medicare benefits. Now, what are we talking about in terms of cost? Well, if you're a female turning 65 just now, you wouldn't be able to buy the F plan, but let's say you wanted to buy the G, that would cost you maybe about $125 a month, maybe a little less if you qualified for a household discount. Um, a plan N, because you're taking on co-pays now and, uh, and the deductible could run you under $90 a month. And a high deductible version of G could maybe be around $45, $50 a month. So you can see every time you're willing to take on a little bit more of the front end responsibility, um, the, the insurance company is going to reward you by reducing your costs. Now, as I said before, the government defines what these plans cover. They also require that insurance companies play by their rules. And rule number one says they have to take you regardless of your health when you first come to Medicare. What does first coming to Medicare mean? Specifically, it means when you activate Part B and you step off of your other qualified coverage, you're going to have an open enrollment window to sign up for any one of these plans in the state of Illinois from any insurance company, and you cannot be denied. They can't ask you anything about your health. You're guaranteed to get the product. And further, they can never single you out for a rate increase based on the claims you file. Okay, they're stuck with you. If you were to get a first diagnosis six months into Medicare and bill, you know, have a million dollars in claims, they'd, they'd have to pay your portion. All right. So if anything that Medicare pays their portion on, your supplement would pay your portion on. So you can never be singled out for a rate increase. Um, it's not like auto insurance. If you, if you have a bad year health wise that you could be dropped. Um, the only time they, they could drop you is if you fail to pay your monthly premium for the plan. All right. So now. As I mentioned before, though, they're spreading all that risk around. So if you file a million dollars in claims, but, you know, one of your people in your risk pool is a marathon runner and they eat vegetables and don't ever go to the doctor, that risk is getting spread out, which is why everybody's policy goes up a little bit in price every year as they get older. OK, because it's a shared claims pool, which is why, again, when I'm looking at this landscape of products and I'm helping people navigate to their the right choice. I like large companies with large risk pools that have been in the med sub business 8, 10, 12 years plus, because with those companies, I can see a demonstrated track record of rate increases that kind of fall in that 5 to 8% range. Um, I can also see the financial ratings of the parent company. I like to deal with A, A, A rated companies, okay? AM best S&P ratings, you can look up the parent, parent companies and see those. Um, and of course, competitive prices. So the bigger companies that can um, bear the, the burden of, you know, a little bit of volatility in a larger risk pool, they tend to be more competitively priced. OK, so that's really how you want to choose one of these plans. In addition to deciding what level of backup coverage you really want, just know that you're going to be guaranteed the product when you first come. Can't be singled out for a rate increase, can't be dropped unless you fail to pay your plan premium. But you do have to budget for increasing costs as you get a little bit older. Now, one thing about these plans is they're month to month policies. So you can actually change them any month out of the year. Maybe you decide that you you want you join the G plan and then a few years later you decide, you know what, that's more coverage than I need. I think I'm going to save a little bit of money and I'm going to move to an end plan. Well, at that juncture, whether you're moving within the same insurance company that you bought the policy initially or you're moving across between, you know, carriers between from one company to another, even if you're staying at the same level of coverage, you're going to have to go through medical underwriting. OK, and medical underwriting is basically going to be you're answering a health questionnaire on the application and the insurance company is going to pull your medical records and your pharmacy report for the last two to five years. Ver de depends varying on the carrier. And they could simply say, thanks, but no thanks, we don't want to cover you, okay? If you've had any recent hospitalizations or surgeries in the past two years, if you've got anything pending that you just haven't addressed, um, they don't want to buy problems because they're, they're going to have to, you know, pay your bills. So that's where you could potentially be locked out of getting this type of coverage later if your health, you know, declines or you have some um, health circumstances that, that are, are more recent, okay? So now that we've made a good decision um, about our supplements, we've we've made, taken a rational assessment of our needs, our budget, um, and we've chosen 
the level, level of coverage we want, and we've, we've picked a good company that's well-rated and has good prices, we still need to add our third piece to this, the, the left-hand side of this chart, and that's our Part D drug coverage. So Medicare Part D kind of has its own set of rules. Um, first and foremost, please know that if you don't pick up a drug plan when you're first eligible and come off of whatever other qualified drug coverage you had previous to Medicare, you will face a late enrollment penalty. Now, from a practical standpoint, this is pennies on the dollar. However, it is cumulative. So typically when people decide not to enroll in a drug plan, it's because they're not taking any medications and they're using good RX or one of these discount coupons to, to fill the meds they do have. But the problem is, is every month that goes by that you didn't have a plan, that you could have had a plan, the Medicare is silently calculating a penalty in the background. And it's 10% um, of the average Part D premium in any given calendar year. So it's been bouncing around between 35 and 40 cents a month, but it's every month. So I have seen people take a pass on Medicare Part D and four, five, seven, 10 years down the line, they've now accumulated you know, 48 or 60 some odd months of penalties and they're paying more in penalties every month than they are in insurance premium, okay? Because what happens is it's not a one-time hit, folks. When you finally decide to choose a Part D plan, that cumulative penalty gets tacked on to your premium every month in perpetuity for the rest of your life. So as I mentioned before, insurance companies have, have gotten wise. They know that you're aging better than your parents. You're eating kale in your smoothies. You're going for walks after dinner. Um, you're exercising and you're staying, staying off of meds to the best of your ability. And so they've got plans now that don't start at $40, $50 a month. They, they have much lower premiums. We may see that change in the coming years as um, legislation rolls, rolls out um, that was passed in the Affordable Care Act. But for right now, as I mentioned, there's a zero premium drug plan or uh, another plan that's under $10 a month that you could just get your foot, foot in the door to avoid any late enrollment penalty. This is also something that you can do over every year during the annual election period. The, the government knows that Prescription drugs can be a volatile piece of people's health care, right? So they want to be able to give you a do-over every year should you need it. Um, so the annual election period happens at the same time every year. It's between October 15th and December 7th. And if you haven't been in Medicare before, um, you, you know it's happening because every other advertisement in between football games in the fall is usually a Medicare ad. OK, um, also, if you're about to turn 65, maybe you're six, eight months away from your birthday, your mailbox has probably exploded with collateral from insurance companies. OK, so these enrollment windows tend to be your 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 triggers to being able to change plans. But the annual election period um, is for anyone who's already in Medicare. If they want to make a change to their Part D plan, they can certainly do it at that time because these run on a calendar year. Now, these are not one size fits all folks. I mentioned before that there are 22, I think, plans available in the state of Illinois this year um, that narrowed a bit from the offering last year. But still, that's a lot of plans to take a look at. How do you pick one? Do I just pick the cheapest one? Do I go for the one that you know has Walgreens as a preferred pharmacy? You could do that, but you also want to look at the specific medication needs that you have and the drugs that you need to fill. Because the one thing that is different besides the premium cost and the cost for the drugs on the plan is the formulary. A formulary is the menu of drugs that every Part D plan covers. Now, Medicare sets a master formulary of all the common prescription drugs people take in Medicare, but then off of that master formulary, every insurance company decides you know, what targeted group they're going to go after. Some people, you know, some plans are designed around all the, the people who are taking all tier one, tier two generics. Other plans are designed around people who are taking higher cost brand name drugs. And then there's things in between. Okay. So just know that when you're looking at plans, even from the same insurance company, they might have three or four offerings, but chances are that the menu of drugs that's covered under each plan differs. Now, one thing that is common across all Medicare Part D plans is stages of coverage that Medicare has set um, and that you get moved through based on the drugs that you're filling. And that looks like this, okay? So if you're still with me, 
Um, this is where Medicare gets a little, a little complicated, but um, I'll try to keep it short and simple. And by the way, you're also going to get this, this chart here in the handouts from the library. So most plans this year had an annual deductible. The standard deductible that was set by Medicare under Part D was $545. Some plans had less, some plans had more. Or I'm sorry, didn't have more. Some had less, some had none at all. Okay. But the maximum deductible was 100 was 545. How it applied could vary by plan. Um, Medicare actually has a five-tier system for prescription drugs, which is a little different than what we're used to on group insurance. Um, tier, usually with group plans, there are three tiers, um, your generics, your brands, and your specialty. Medicare spreads that out a little to foster some competition in the pharmaceutical industry. But the bottom line is, is your tier ones and twos are your preferred generics and generics. They're pretty inexpensive. When you go to fill them, um, you're going to have a very nominal copay, maybe no copay at all. OK, your tier threes and fours are usually the drugs that are advertised on TV. Um, maybe they have a famous spokesperson if they haven't been out of FDA approval for very long, but they, they're a higher value drug. OK, the retail value is higher, which you're going to pay at the pharmacy to fill them is higher. And then tier five specialty drugs. This is stuff like anti-rejection medication after transplant, AIDS medication, oral chemotherapy. Um, but that tiering system exists on every drug plan. And. A single drug can be tiered differently on different plans. That's important to know too. So let's go back to this deductible. Sometimes on drug plans, that deductible applies to drugs on all the tiers. You just have to pay it before you start to pay your copay when you fill your meds. On other plans, sometimes it applies to only the drugs on the higher tiers. So that's something important to know because you could be taking 20 medications and have a plan with a deductible, but if all your drugs are on tier one and two and the deductible doesn't apply to anything on tier one and two, you're not gonna have to pay toward that deductible. But once you've fulfilled that deductible, then you're in what we call the initial stage of coverage. And there's an associated copay or coinsurance amount under the drug plan that you've chosen for every drug that you're taking. And that's what you'll pay when you're in that initial stage of coverage. Now, you see some other numbers here. What's this $5,030 in total drug, drug cost? I got to spend $5,030 in total drugs? No, you don't. Um, but what Medicare is doing while you're paying your nominal copays in the initial stage of coverage is they're tracking the value that your drugs are worth. So you could be filling $700 worth of drugs, and you've got a drug plan where you're able to get those drugs for a $70 copay. But every time you pay 70, Medicare's tracking that 700 and they're adding up 700 in January, 700 in February, 700 in March. And it doesn't take long to see that by about August or September, you're going to hit that $5,030 worth of drug threshold. OK, when you do that, if you get to that marker in a calendar year, Medicare says, OK, now you need to go into the coverage gap. Some people refer to it as the donut hole. I don't know why, but it's not a sweet place to be. I'll tell you that. Because when you get there, all of the medications that you're filling now, some may had a, maybe had a zero copay, some maybe had a you know, $20, $50 copay, some might have had a percentage of coinsurance. But across the board, once you're in the coverage gap, you're going to pay 25% of retail on everything that you're filling. So the cost of some drugs might go up, the cost of other drugs might go down. And you're going to be stuck paying that amount for all of your meds, no matter what drug plan you're on, until you reach an $8,000 threshold. <clears throat> now, the way you get there, excuse me, <clears throat> is it's a combination of what you paid and how the insurance has supported you between the initial stage of coverage and the coverage gap. So it's not like you're going to pay $8,000 out of your pocket to get rate relief, but you could be paying, you know, anywhere between two, three, four, thousand dollars $4,000, okay? Just depends on what you're filling. <clears throat> so once you get to that threshold, then you get rate relief. And Inflation Reduction Act legislation that went into effect this year in January said if somebody hits catastrophic coverage, they're not paying anything anymore for their meds. Okay, there's no copays, no out of pocket expenses. You go to the pharmacy, you pick it up, they're zero. All right. But it does cost quite a bit of money to get to that rate relief. So again, no max out of pocket concept yet in Medicare Part D. There's some legislation that was passed that might put caps next year in 2026 at 2000. But right now, for this year, this is what we're dealing with. All right. So how do we pick a drug plan? 
Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to Medicare.gov, or you're going to work with somebody like me that will help you, you know, put your drugs into a system, do some quoting, look at the price of your drugs across all the plans, Factor in your pharmacy because every plan has different preferred versus standard pharmacy partners. Preferred pharmacy partners will generally charge you less than standard. And then out of network, of course, you don't want to use out of network because you're going to pay full retail there. Okay. But I use this find health and drug plans tab. We log in somebody's medications um, and we, you know, it'll list all the plans available in the state that cover the medications and at what cost. And then we look at the total out-of-pocket cost for the months that they're going to be on the plan that combines the cost for the insurance plus the cost to fill their meds. And usually we also look at the star ratings on these plans. Medicare actually does star rate these plans on a five-star scale. I generally try to stick with plans that are three stars and above. Okay. There are no, that I know of, there are no four-star plans in the Part D drug space in Illinois this year. Okay. But three, threes are very good. Okay. Now, when we plug in all that data, we're going to get something back that looks a little bit like this. So here we have a drug plan that's $27 and change a month. It's got that $545 deductible, which I know which plan this is. It actually applies to drugs on only tier three, four, and five. And so what this is um, aggregating, because this is a March to December estimate, is that our premium times those months is going to cost $277. But then when we go to fill our drugs based on the tiering structure and the pharmacy that we're using, we're going to pay $1,438 for our meds. All right. So our tier ones, twos, threes, fours, and fives have these associated costs, zero, seven dollars $46, and then a percentage of retail for our tier four and five. Walgreens is a preferred pharmacy. We like seeing that little green button there. This is actually the full retail value of all the meds we're filling. So I just plugged in a, a couple of medications, this Eliquis being our most expensive, and we're, we're at a run rate of $637 in, in full retail cost, right? But this $27 plan that we're filling uh, or, or that we're using, once we um, get past that deductible, that 545 deductible, which is going to happen the first time we fill the Eliquis, right? Then we're going to be in the initial stage of coverage. And, and that's a pretty good deal because we're filling $637 worth of medications for $72.96. Okay, the lisinopril and atorvastatin are nothing. The Eliquis is going to be $46. And our Ventolin, if we switch that to an albuterol inhaler, it would probably be even less. All right. But as we're filling those meds at $72 out of our pocket, Medicare is tracking that $637. So by about October, if you do the math, you're going to hit that $5,030 threshold. And then you're going to be in the coverage gap for October and November, December. And your $72 pharmacy bill is now going to jump to $159. Okay. So this is what we really have to keep in mind when we're researching drug plans is how are our drugs treated? How are they tiered? What's the cost by tier? Is the pharmacy that we like to use um, preferred or standard? All this matters. All right. So now we've got full and complete coverage down the path of original Medicare. And as the years go by, maybe we tweak our Part D during the annual enrollment. Maybe we, we reapply for a Medicare supplement plan to try to bring prices down if they've gone up over five, 10 years time. Or maybe we look to an alternative source of coverage. We can also do this during the annual enrollment, or we can choose this initially. But it is an either or choice. And you got to have Medicare A and B turned on to get a Medicare Advantage Part C plan. Sometimes people think, oh, I see these zero premium plans advertised or very low premium plans. And it tells me I you know, can see a primary care doctor for free and get all my preventative care for free. That means I don't have to sign up for Medicare, right? No, 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 no. You do have to sign up for Medicare. You do have to pay into the Medicare system. But what happens is, is Medicare washes their hands of you. They pass that premium money that they're collecting from you um, through the social security system. They pass it over to a private insurance company and they say, okay, you guys take care of Robin. You run her benefits under part A, B, and D. And then you get to decide how you wanna charge her for those services under A, B, and D. And that's exactly what they do. So it's important to know that nobody gets out of paying for their Medicare benefits and particularly those part B premiums. Um, I should mention, if you decide to take Social Security retirement benefits before you enroll in Medicare and or before age 65, I should say, you'll be auto-enrolled in Medicare. 
And if you don't want Medicare at age 65 because you're still working and you love your group insurance, you got to sign the back of that card and send it back into Social Security. OK, but a lot of people are deferring on their retirement benefits because they're working and they want to get their full retirement benefits. So maybe they're not going to take it till 67 or 68, but they want to sign up for Medicare at 65. That's fine. Um, the Social Security office will bill you quarterly for those premiums. OK, so either way, when you decide to fire up your your A and your B, you got to pay those premiums. Either they're going to be deducted out of your retirement benefit or you're going to be billed quarterly for them. This is a private insurance product, Medicare Part C, Medicare Advantage. Even though it is a Medicare plan, just like supplement plans, they're sold by private insurance companies. Same with drug plans. They're sold by private insurance companies. Um, these plans actually are available by county. So what happens is, in, is the, the county that you live in um, is going to be the first filter for what plans are available for you to choose from. Now, here's a here's a good news. Um, the state of Illinois is a very competitive Medicare insurance product market. And so in any given county in our state, we have between probably 45 and 50 plans per county. So there's a lot to choose from. There's PPO plans, there's HMO plans, there's fee-for-service plans, there's medical savings plans, there's all different kinds. Most people generally will gravitate toward an HMO or a PPO based on you know, what they've had during their working years. But that's that's the first filter. Um, yes, these plans may include some extra bells and whistles like dental vision hearing. Not always, but they might include them. Um, and these are things that, you know, from a preventative care standpoint, Medicare doesn't cover you for. First rule, though, the first thing that's different than being in that original Medicare path is you no longer can see any doctor anywhere in the U.S. that accepts Medicare. You are now going to be in a PPO network or maybe even a more restrictive HMO network. And if you've always operated that way, and you have no problem with that, this can be a perfectly fine solution for you. However, you definitely want to make sure that whatever plans you're looking at, your current doctors that are currently important to your care are actually in network on your plan. Because even on a PPO where you may have in and out of network benefits, you want to try to stay in network as much as possible because you'll pay less for services if you do. There's co-payments for everything. So despite what the advertising likes to tell people, and I love the industry I work in, but I'm not particularly fond of how they advertise to people. Um, they like to talk about all the free, free, free stuff or the things that have zero cost here or zero premium there. Um, but to just be clear, Medicare Advantage plans, even those that have a zero premium per month, they will have co-pays for everything you do beyond your preventive care. OK, so you may be able to see your primary care doctor at no copay. You may be able to get a physical at no pay copay. You may be able to get your bone density, your mammography at no copay. But you're going to pay for every specialist visit, every night in the hospital, every ER visit, every urgent care visit, every lab test, every X-ray generally. OK, now, as you're paying for services that you're obtaining, they're counting towards some max out of pocket. So unlike original Medicare that has no max out of pocket concept, these plans do have capped exposure. If you're on an HMO, it's going to be one number, and it'll, that number will generally be lower than if you're on a PPO. If you're on a PPO, you're going to have two numbers, one number that tracks toward all in-network services and another number that will cap you out if you go in or out of network for services. A lot of these plans, most of these plans, have your Part D drug coverage included. So that's kind of nice. You don't have to go get that separate. It's all in one package of benefits from that private insurance company. There are plans that don't have drug coverage. Those are called Medicare Advantage only. The ones with drug coverage are Medicare Advantage with prescription drug coverage. Um, sometimes people have other sources for drugs. Maybe they're a veteran and they've got VA benefits and they get drug coverage through the VA. They might be interested in a plan without drug coverage, but everybody else would, would generally need a plan with the drug coverage included. So they're not penalized. And then again, just like drug plans, these plans run on a calendar year. So if you jump into a Medicare Part C plan in July, because that's when you turn 65 and signed up for Medicare, that's great. You can carry that plan through the end of the year. And heck, if you like it, you can just let it auto renew into the next year. All right. Um, or you have that window between October 15th and December 7th that if you wanted to change it, you could change it for the following calendar year. All right. So those are really the two paths that you can travel. A and B starts your party. You got to turn that on first. And then generally people will either, either line up their Medigap plan and their drug plan to start at the same time as Medicare Part B, or they'll choose a Medicare Advantage option, okay? A lot of times I get asked, Robin, which is better? 
which is worse. There's not a better or worse. They're just different. Um, hopefully those differences were illuminated tonight. Managed care is, you know, your Medicare Advantage model provider network that's going to be a little narrower than any doctor that accepts Medicare. Um, and, and it's more pay as you go. You know, you're definitely in a Medicare replacement plan versus having a secondary bill payer to just back up your Medicare benefits. And then you're piecing in things like your drug coverage or some preventative care like dental or vision with separate policies. All right. If you need help navigating that journey, I'm here to help. I'm here to answer questions. Again, there's no charge for our services. We get compensated by insurance companies. I've got no horse in the race. I've got no skin in the game. I don't, it doesn't matter to me if you choose Advantage or Supplement or which company you go with, but I, I certainly will, you know, have a conversation with you about your needs, your budget, your lifestyle, your doctors, your medications, and, and we'll make some recommendations um, to, to align with that. Um, there is a lot of choice here. And it is, is definitely um, an overwhelming thing to navigate when you first get started, but we're here to help. And again, um, you know, thank you for your time tonight. It was a pretty quiet crowd, Erin, so I'm wondering if we had any questions come in on chat. I'd be happy to answer those or anybody who wants to ask a question now. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, no, there are no questions in the chat. I'm hoping, I mean... According to my settings, the chat should be working. Okay. If uh, if someone is, if there is a problem with the chat and someone wants to click the raise your hand button or something, you can do that. But uh, but otherwise, please type any questions in the chat for Robin. You know, um, I will I will mention one thing, Erin. A lot of people do ask, especially when I'm I'm talking about you know Medicare Advantage and and supplement plans. So just to review. Um, people always wonder about changing, right? So again, supplement plans are month to month policies. You're guaranteed to get those when you first come to Medicare, but then after you've been in Medicare for six months to change those plans, you'll be medically underwritten. Okay. We do have one insurance company in Illinois that doesn't medically underwrite, but they're the only one. Um, and so most carriers will ask you to, um, to answer the health questionnaire and they'll pull your medical records. Uh, drug plans run on a calendar year, so you can change those during the annual enrollment without question. Okay, there's no medical underwriting, no considerations about your health or what medications have changed. Um, you just get that do over, okay, between October 15th and December 7th for the coming benefit year. And same with Advantage. Um, never any medical underwriting or health questions to get one of those plans because there's a cost structure within the plan. So, you know, some actuary somewhere has figured out that works for the insurance company how to not lose money on you, right? They're, they're well funded by Medicare premium dollars and federal tax dollars. Um, and then they've figured out a cost structure within the plan. And if that's reasonable to you, um, you know, you can kind of figure out what you might pay out of pocket based on how you obtain health care throughout the year. But um, but, you know, you can change those plans during the calendar year without any consideration about your health. If you move out of the service area for your drug plan or for your Advantage plan, you will get a special enrollment to make a, a new plan selection at that point. OK, for some reason, people like to retire outside of the state of Illinois. I don't know why, which is why you see that I'm licensed in multiple states, because a lot of my clients have retired in other places. Um, but they get special enrollments to, to change their drug coverage or or their advantage plans when they when they move to a different geography. So whether it's a county transition or whether you're crossing state lines, if your current plan isn't available to you anymore, you get that opportunity to make that change at that moment. Great. Okay. So the chat is working. We have uh, a few people just commenting. Very informational. Uh, excellent information. Thank you. It looks like there's a question that came in. Yeah. Just, so the, the during the initial medic, Medicare enrollment. So um, you can switch between supplement plans. So there's a, so there's the initial enrollment when you first sign up for Medicare, right? Three months before your birthday, three months after. If you decide to wait, maybe you sign up for the Part A, or maybe you don't sign up for either, and you defer to retirement, let's say, at 68 or 69, and you sign up at that point, you're going to trigger a, an open enrollment for a Medigap plan. So those supplements, also called Medigap plans in particular, six months before that sign up period, six months after, where you can apply to as many different supplement, you can change your plan as many times as you want, and you will not be asked any medical questions. 
it's after that window closes and everybody gets that one time in their life that then to reapply for a Medicare supplement plan, um, you will be medically underwritten. People seem to think that the annual enrollment in the fall between October and December um, is a time where they can get a Medigap plan without medical underwriting. And that's actually not true. Um, that that one time shot happens when you first come to Medicare and you make that choice initially when you've stepped off of other qualified coverage and you've activated Part B. Um, when you're on an Advantage plan, the very first time you ever try Medicare Advantage, the first year you're in a Part C model of insurance, you actually have a full year um, to get out of that and move back to original Medicare if you want. Okay, that's called a one-year trial, right? Um, and if you do that um, during that first year, Based on when you became Medicare eligible, there will be a certain set of Medicare supplement plans that you can choose without medical underwriting, but you won't have an opportunity to select from all of them. Okay. I hope that answered your question. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, they say thank you. So I think that okay. that answer did it. Um, I know this is a lot of information to process. I am, am so grateful for you, Robin, for trying to explain all of this, <laughs> show us the visuals. Not a problem. Um, and for to let everyone else know, Robin will be presenting for us again on April 21st at the Northfield Branch Library. So if you'd like to watch this presentation again in person and maybe yep. talk to Robin in person, you'll have that opportunity. Um, there's there's a question in the chat about, can you please talk about foreign coverage? Oh, yeah. So um, Medicare is not recognized out of this country. OK, it's the U.S. health insurance for seniors. So what happens when you're traveling overseas? Um, I do have a, a carrier that I work with that I have a global travel coverage. And, and mo most of my Medicare clients will just add that for the two-week trip or the month that they're going to be away. Um, it's very affordable, very flexible. But um, if you are in original Medicare, okay, and you have one of these Medicare supplement plans that has this foreign travel emergency coverage right here, okay, 80%, the way that works is this. So you're out of country, you have a medical event, you pay out of pocket for that medical event, and then you bring it back to the States and you submit those bills to Medicare. For that emergency, Medicare is gonna pass the entirety of that bill over to your supplemental insurer. Your supplemental insurer will charge you an, a, a separate $250 deductible on that medical event, and then they'll pay 80% of the bill and you'll be responsible for 20% 20, 20 of the bill, okay? Now, it's important to know that that 80% that the insurance company will pick up for the emergency, um, it caps out at 50,000 in your lifetime. So it's a decent chunk, but it's not, you know, uh, unlimited. They, they, there is a cap on that at 50000 in your lifetime, okay? Which is why a lot of people will look to add a global major medical plan when, they're, when they travel out of country. Um, Thank you. Now, I, the field info in there. Yeah. Yeah, I just typed that in because someone asked um, to repeat the date when you'll speak for us again. So we yes. have that day locked down and... And I try to have Robin um, do this presentation uh, uh, about every times. quarter, you yeah. know, because um, yep. stuff changes and, and your lives change. And um, someone said in the chat, um, thanks, Robin. This is good information and great timing for us. Oh, and, good. And good. every quarter, it's great timing for somebody. <laughs> So I just want to let everybody know, you know, the Winneka Norfield Library is wonderful because they do this program on a fairly regular basis. But, um, you know, if you're geographically not near there and and or you've got a friend or a loved one who, you know, maybe is down in DuPage County or something um, on our website, Medicare Solutions Network .com, We have a rolling list of all the seminars we're doing. It would either be myself or one of my colleagues. Um, sometimes they're virtual. A lot of times they're in person at the libraries themselves. So you can always like pop onto that schedule and just see what else is kind of in and around the area. Fantastic. Thank you so much for you know sure. sharing this important information. And um, to, to say again to everyone, 
probably tomorrow I will email a link to this recording. It will be available for a limited time. Um, and it, attached to that email will be the handouts Robin mentioned. Yep. All right. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thank you, Robin. Thank you so much. Have a great and night. Have, have a good night. Thanks. Bye.